I'm Zach Childs and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today our guest is Justin Ostrander. Justin, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So what was your earliest musical memory? Um, let's see. My dad was a big gearhead when I was a kid. Not in yeah. the way that we talk about it with okay. uh, guitars and amps and stuff. He was really into cars. And so okay. I would go help him work on whatever car he had in the garage. He had a couple Camaros, he had an El Camino, you know, uh, lots of stuff like that. He liked to go fast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there was a radio station in Topeka called V100 mm -hmm. that when I was a kid, they literally only played classic rock. So it, it was a lot of like Steppenwolf and Zeppelin and Foghat and Foreigner and stuff like that. And I just remember that being on all the time, all day and night in the garage. Like he just would never turn it off. And he, would, he had this old Marantz. Uh, Marantz. Mm -hmm. He had this old Marantz stereo that he got for high school graduation that, that we just listened to that station on. And I remember thinking, like, this is really cool music. My dad likes cool music. I don't know if any of my other friends think their dad <laughs> likes cool music, you know. Yeah. But I, I just remember going out there and trying to find a wrench as quickly as I could for him under the car and hearing ZZ Top and thinking it was the coolest thing, you know, in the background. So how did you end up picking the, the guitar? Uh, well, that is also his fault. Um, he came home one day when I was in sixth or seventh grade with a, uh, a really awful Squire Strat. It had a humbucker in the back, two single coils. It was black. Um, and somebody had fashioned a pit guard out of linoleum for it. Wow. Yeah, it, it looked like it, it had been cut with you know, shears in a shop class or something. And then they drilled it into the face of the guitar. And in that case, uh, with the guitar, there was a book of, of some Led Zeppelin tunes, like not even the whole songs, like just riffs and selected solos and stuff from Jimmy Page. And, and I was like, wait a minute, I've heard this. I've heard this in the garage. I, I recognize Heartbreaker and Black Dog and a whole lot of love and stuff like that. And so that was... Uh, the last time my parents saw me. <laughs> I basically didn't come out of my room for my entire teenage years, you know. And about the guitar, I, I can't confirm or deny this, but uh, I found out much later that the guy who sold that guitar to my dad was actually my cousin who lived a couple hours away. And the story is, again, I can't, I can't confirm this, if this is true or not, and I wonder if I should change names for the sake of those involved. The story is he stole it from another guitar player as a joke when their bands were doing shows together. And the guy uh, was kind of a real hothead and he got so mad and was saying some things that he was gonna do to whoever took his guitar to where my cousin was like, oh, I, I can't tell him that I did this. <laughs> so he sold it, he was like, I'll sell it to uh, my uncle a couple hours away or whatever and 
be done with that. So apparently, it was, it was, a, a, stolen, it was a stolen item. But so, I don't so, have it anymore. I don't know if that's true. It's, it's a fun story. So beyond uh, you know work, working with this you know kind of songbook that you had, uh, were you taking lessons? No. Uh, shortly after um, I got that guitar, my grandparents had bought a guitar magazine subscription for me, mm -hmm. and I, I've been through all of them. Like there was the one that was just called Guitar. It was previously guitar for the practicing musician in the yes. 80s, mm -hmm. which I found a bunch of back issues. Oh, man. And they had a lot of tablature in them. In, in music yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, that was easy because it just, it just made sense. It's like, here's the lines of the strings with numbers on the strings. It's like, well, that's probably the number of fret I should put my finger on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would hear the, the rhythm on the radio or, or a CD or whatever, you know, and, and so I wasn't really learning to read music. It was, it was all by ear and sort of with this visual aid of, of the tab or chord symbols, you know. But I, I, you know, I was completely self-taught and um, probably learned a lot of the wrong way to do things, you know, and, uh, but I kind of have my own thing, I guess, yeah. now, so. So what was your first paid professional gig? Oh gosh, let me think about that. Paid, actual money. No, it could have been food. Okay. Yeah. Well, in the eighth grade, right after getting this guitar, uh, a neighbor of ours, two houses down in North Topeka, they had a their annual Fourth of July party, mm -hmm. and it was basically my family and a bunch of other families would go there. The parents would drink too much, and the kids would hang out and try not to get in the way. Mm -hmm. Well, they wanted to have live music, and so I called a drummer and a bass player, and none of us really sang. Like, I sang a little bit. I'm terrible, don't make me do that today. Uh, but we, we played, like, Skinner and Zeppelin, and, and I played the Star Spangled Banner, like, Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. style, you know, which was probably terrible, it was probably so bad. I mean, if I were to listen to that now, I'm sure it'd be really funny, but they, they covered, uh, what did they pay us? I don't even remember. It was, it was probably fifty bucks a guy or something. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Eighth yeah. grade. Yeah, it was good money. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. everybody was so drunk that we were probably really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> what did What did you do with the money? Uh, I probably bought something guitar wise with it. Okay. Uh, maybe an overdrive pedal. Yeah. And what kind of overdrive pedal was it? Well. Um, I'm sorry that you asked that. My first overdrive pedal was a uh, a DoD grunge pedal. Because the, uh, the 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 flip side of um, the classic rock thing is, I was sort of growing up as as the Seattle scene was exploding, right? You know? And so I had Zeppelin and ZZ Top in one ear, you know, whenever I was in my dad's garage or hanging out at, at the house. And then Nirvana and Soundgarden and you know Stone Temple Pilots and Pearl Jam and all all mm -hmm. those massive rock bands of the '90s and the other year. So I saw that the pedal was called Grunge. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, maybe it'll make me sound like those guys. Yeah. It was terrible. Yeah. The marketing worked, but the, the it tone, sure did. It sure did. They they out. got me. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was playing it through a, uh, a solid state Crate amp, so that might have affected. <laughs> might have hampered its ability to. Yeah. So, so then, uh, moving on, uh, you started you know playing more gigs. You got in, got into college. Tell us about uh, your progression as a guitarist as you went on. Well, um, yeah, I, I kept playing local bands, you know, uh, throughout high school. And when I went to college, I moved into a house with a bunch of guys, and there were some songwriters. And you know, we had this big bar district in Manhattan, Kansas. That's where I went to school. I went to K State, uh, called Aggieville which okay. is notorious. Like there's just bar after bar after bar after bar. I, I haven't been there in years, so I don't know if it's still like that, but you know, you could play anywhere, um, about 10 different places, all within like two blocks, you know? So there were more weekends than not that we were doing cover gigs and playing some friends original music, you mm -hmm. know? It was very uh, Americana, rock, that sort of thing. And I, uh, 
I think it was in my sophomore year of college that I walked into the guitar store in Manhattan, Kansas, and um, they had an opening for a guitar teacher. And it actually paid really well compared to, you know, like the kind of jobs you normally get in college, like working mm-hmm. at Subway or something, which I did. Yeah. Uh, so I got to the point where I had 35, 40 students wow. that I would just schedule in around my classes at K-State. And, you know, I was teaching kids as young as five all the way to guys who had grandkids who were like, man, I'm going to figure the guitar out finally, you mm-hmm. know. Most of my students were high school kids who wanted to impress a girl or learn a Blink-182 song, you know. And I thought that their parents would probably be upset giving me so much money to teach them just a punk song. So uh, we learned a lot about, or we talked a lot about uh, the guitar, the fretboard, where where the notes are, what are the names of these chords, why, does, why do we call a C chord a C chord, you know, mm-hmm. there's basic theory involved as well. So I took a lot of um, like jazz classes in college. Just I wanted to play, you know. Mm-hmm. So I played in a couple combos in one of the big bands, and and I remember when I learned about theory, it was like, oh, that's why this sounds good. That's why this works, or whatever, you know. And so my students, I would teach them the thing they wanted to learn, the Blink One Eighty Two song, but also you need to do some real work and come back. And man, it was really rewarding because they would they would get it down and they'd come back and they're like, all right, let's let's keep going. Like yeah. this is fantastic. You know, and so I I felt like, you know, um, I just felt really uh, satisfied as a teacher, you know, and still being able to play. And some students would come in and want to take lessons and they were really good. I'm like, oh, I gotta go practice, I gotta stay ahead of this guy, you know. Right. And so my playing grew a lot in college because of that. You know, i Learn by my ear, listening to the radio, making, I'd make mixtapes to learn stuff, you know, uh, in my teens. And then in college, a lot of what I learned was trying to stay ahead of somebody who wanted to learn something that I had no idea about. Mm-hmm. So it's a great way to learn. Yeah, yeah. And just kept kicking through all that, that time. So in, in college, it sounds like you learned to read music and you learned, you learned theory. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say that I learned how to. I, I can read pretty well. I can read, like, if you give me the big band book to a, a, like, for a jazz band or something, the Mm -hmm. guitar music is pretty easy to read. It's mostly chord symbols. Mm -hmm. And there's an occasional line that's written out, notes on a staff. That's that's what takes me a little bit of time, you know. Um, But, I mean, here, it's just been the number system, you know, which is nothing. (laughs) So let's let's get to Nashville. How how do you get from, uh, from... you know, from the university, how do you, you know, move from there to, to Nashville? Now, now what, what degree did you get? Okay, you, well, you went there, all right. Yeah. I have two mathematics degrees okay. from K-State. Yes. So uh, I, I had changed my major eight times by the time it was all said and done. That's I, impressive. I just had, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, I switched between all these different things, and it's like, well, I guess I'm learning what I want to do by process of elimination, you know. And my seventh major was engineering. Uh, I switched into that my first senior year. <laughs> Does that sound ridiculous? And uh, there was a lot of math, a lot of physics. There was some drafting involved mm-hmm. and some business classes. Uh, the math and the physics, I loved. The drafting and the business side of it, I was kind of like, ah, it's not my favorite. And just to see how long it was going to take me to finish a bachelor's degree, I looked through the K-State course catalog and... It was going to take me seven and a half years, starting an engineering degree in my senior year, to finish. So I thought, okay, I just, I just need to finish at this point. I need to figure something out to finish. So I looked at the math and physics programs. Uh, in my first year of engineering, I'd taken the entire calculus sequence and differential equations, which is kind of a, the end cap of that, that course, um, those courses. And at that point... Every upper level math class is available to you. So I took 21 hours of math my fifth year just so I could finish a degree. And at that point, I met my wife, uh, my future wife. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really want to leave yet. I wanted to figure out where that was going to go. So my professors wanted me to stick around and go to grad school. It wasn't because I'm like super brilliant or anything. It's because I speak speak English pretty Mm -hmm. well. 
which a lot of the grad students, you know, they're, I, man, I, I met so many people from all over the world. Uh, there, there were guys from Nepal, uh, from India, from the Ukraine, you know, guys and girls all over the place. Mm-hmm. We, in my, my office, my grad student office, we had an Englishman and a Scotsman. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it was an Englishman and an Irishman. So it was two-thirds to the start of a bad joke, right? Yeah. And then, you know, a bunch of people from Asia, and uh, it, it was a really cool experience. I thought that teaching, you know, would be, would be fun because I enjoyed yeah. teaching guitar. Well, people don't like to learn math the way they like to learn guitar. Yeah. So uh, at that point, um, I kind of just had to ask myself, like, what do I really want to do? I should at least try. You know, I've always had it in the back of my mind, like, man, you should try to play guitar for a living. Actually try to do it, you know. And I thought that if I didn't try, I was going to always wonder. I just had to at least get it out of my system. So my wife and I moved to Nashville. So you were married by this point? Yeah, we moved uh, on our one-year anniversary. And uh, I didn't know a single person in town. I didn't, I didn't know really what to expect. I had been corresponding with a couple of people uh, online, um, two guys that you probably know, a guy named Glenn Pierce, mm-hmm. fantastic guitar player, and uh, Michael Britt, who's another, another great, fantastic yeah. guitar player. And they, they both were uh, pretty generous with answering just the most ridiculous questions that I had to ask, like, mm-hmm. what part of town do I need to live in to get the most work? You know, yeah. like, like you couldn't drive somewhere, right. you know? Uh, just stuff like that. And I moved here, and you know, when I got here, it was 2006. I've been here 10 years. Oh, well, it's coming up on 11, I guess. And uh, it still felt like a small town. You know, everybody was pretty pretty friendly, and the community was very close-knit. And so, you know, I just, I happened to be standing in the uh, back of a room. Um, this is how I got my first gig. I went to a, uh, a songwriter night at the Blue Bar, which is in Midtown. Okay. And there was a house band, and... A writer who had put on the evening and she had probably eight other writers and they would each get up and do one of their songs or two of their songs so and they all split the cost of the band so the band played you know an hour and a half set or whatever made some money and all these mm-hmm. writers got to you know they're all independent so you know they got to play play their stuff live with a band without having to foot the whole bill themselves right uh, I was standing in the back of the room and the girl who had put it on was standing kind of right in front of me and her guitar player between songs comes down and he's he's looking at his phone and he's like i i can't be here next week my bus call isn't at midnight like i thought we're going to the northeast so it's going to be a lot longer trip we have to leave at like 5 30 i can't do the gig next week and she was like oh that's okay don't worry about it i'll find somebody and he's like thanks for understanding and, and he left and and i could see that she was kind of frustrated she's like dang it what am i going to do yeah. so i tapped on her shoulder it's like, yeah, I know you don't know me, but I may be in a position to help you out if, if you run through your list and you can't find anybody. While she, I think, was more thankful to not have to think about it. Mm-hmm. And so she and her acoustic guitar player uh, came over to my house that week, and they had given me some songs beforehand, and we went through it, and they were like, oh, this is going to be great. All right, yeah, yeah, we'll see you Thursday night. You know. Yeah. And one thing led to another. It seemed like every time I played out, uh, there was somebody in the crowd who liked what I did and didn't know who I was and introduced themselves and um, it just sort of snowballed from there and I, I spent a long time touring um, probably seven years six or seven years of it like I, I made a decision to stay in town when my wife and I started having kids uh, to do the session thing right which was the goal that I had moving here from the very beginning you know I didn't want to move to a town married and, and just be like, I'm gonna be on the road the rest of my life, so I'll see you <laughs> between gigs or whatever. It was all, uh, I always wanted to end up recording, you know, staying in town. I love the studio, I love the um, the challenges, the creativity, uh, just that whole aspect of it. And mm. that's what I've been in in the last, just the last couple of years, really. So when you moved to town and, and you started picking up these things, were you having to supplement your income by doing other things? Man, um... Or were you able to kind of get, get the ball rolling quickly as far as, you know, some playing? Yeah. I, yeah. 
am incredibly blessed because I never had a day job. I never wow. had to. Um, from teaching in Kansas, I saved up a bunch of money. Uh, my wife got a job pretty quickly, and I uh, really just kind of hit the ground running. You know, I, her family wasn't super on board <laughs> with us moving. <laughs> 12 hours away, so I felt like I had an extra extra incentive to, to really like sh- show them, like, I'm not just running from responsibility and chasing fame or something mm-hmm. ridiculous, you know. Uh, so. so then the, the road thing to the, to the session thing, you know, that, those are kind of two different worlds to a degree. And so, yeah. how, you know, how, how did you start, you know, did you all of a sudden just stop touring or were you able, how did you start making the transition? Well, um, let's see. A few years into living here, I, I met enough people that, that I was starting to get some calls for really like low budget overdubs, mm-hmm. you know. And so when I made the decision to hang up the road hat, and to be in town only, um, I had a few accounts, you know, people that would uh, call me to to fix something that they had done, you know. There there are some there are some situations here in town where things move really fast, like demo sessions where you're doing five, maybe six songs in a three hour block. Right. And sometimes writers will walk away from that, and they're like, "Man, we just." this is great, we've got a great foundation, but I want to add some things. Or, I love the guitar part, but it's too close to something else, you know, maybe that that guitar player had played on something. Had played on on another song. Yeah, so they would call me, I had a few people who would call me to add or replace or just, you know, spend some time on it. And I was happy to spend whatever time needed to get, you know, it's all about earning trust, right? And And just a a quick aside, it's it's very common to have you know, a lot of great players have had their parts replaced. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that is not saying, yeah. yeah, It's it's just a a thing that happens in town. And sometimes you'll see multiple guitar players listed, you know, on a track and actually you're only hearing like one or two of them. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I'm sure it's it's happened with with my, what I've done too. I think it's more about the writer or the producer having an idea after they've left the situation, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so that's that's kind of how I'd gotten started. And um, in 2011, uh, I made the decision that I really wanted to get off the road. So what's, uh, I was thinking like, what's my exit strategy gonna be? Well, I knew that I had to save up a bunch of money because mm-hmm. we, were, we were pregnant and my wife was gonna quit her job. And so it was gonna basically be all on me. So, at that point, uh, David Nail had had a really big hit called Let It Rain, and mm-hmm. I did so many gigs with him, I was able to put away a, a lot of money to sort of buffer my transition, you know? Right. And in the spring of 2013, um, I basically decided that I, I wasn't gonna go back out on the road, I wasn't gonna look for a new gig, I was just gonna stay in town, you know? And that, you know, that still meant doing some one-offs here and there, but I wasn't gonna get on another tour, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, I basically told everybody that I knew, like, hey, I do sessions now. Yeah. More than I've been. So this is it. So if you, I know you got your guys. I know you, you've got your thing. But if you want to try something out, if, if somebody bails on you at the last minute, I will probably be available, you know. And it's just sort of happened. It's been very slow. But yeah. thankfully, because, you know, I'm, I'm able to, to uh, practice and learn new stuff, you know. And just kind of be prepared for the next call that comes, you know. Because yeah. in, in the beginning, you know, when you're when you're trying to get in, it's all about being ready for when somebody's sick, somebody bails at the last minute, and you have to be that guy that your year is is ready to go, and you're you're ready to hop in the car. And absolutely, go. absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I don't remember who, I don't know who to attribute this quote to, yeah. but it, it's uh, what is it? What is it? It says it's something like. Um, Luck is when opportunity meets preparation. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I probably totally butchered that. But yeah. I wanted to be prepared for when the opportunity presented itself. And early on, man, I got, I've had more than a few calls at 10, 15. Hey, man, can you be down here? Because somebody didn't show up and we don't know where he is. 
can you be here like five minutes ago, you know? And yeah. So I'd, of course, of course, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm in my, you know, I'm still in pajamas, like cleaning the house or something. Like I wasn't planning on leaving for a while. Yeah. Grab my, all my stuff, get in the car and fly down to Sound Emporium or whatever, you know? Yeah. So. What's the, uh, the, the craziest like last minute session that you ever had? Um, craziest last minute. Let's see. Well, the, the one that I keep thinking about, a friend of mine, and if he watches this, he'll be like, oh, that's me, he's talking about me. He thought that he was scheduled for a two o'clock mm-hmm. when it was a 10, and he was not awake at the time. And so they, I got a call from the writer, you know, can you come down here? Can you play acoustic? Can you bring an acoustic and a banjo? And yeah. it's like, absolutely, absolutely. So I got there at 10 35 10 40 and just basically jumped in on the second song and uh went back and played Over on the first them. song after after the fact and it's like hey thanks thanks for the call you know yeah. and you know that everybody in those situations is so if you can if you can walk in and kind of save the day in a way it i think it really works out to your favor it might be a really long time before you hear from that person again you know but you're you're on the radar you know. So Justin, you were giving kind of some some advice there. So what are what are some of the best bits of advice that you've gotten from uh, from other players or producers or? Um, well, uh, something uh, I, I told you that Mike Britt and I kind of corresponded before I moved to town. Something that he told me uh, before I moved to Nashville that has stuck with me is that everybody here is really good. There are loads of really good guitar players here, but there's always room for another great musician, you know? And so I, I took that to mean uh, that it's not impossible, <laughs> you know? Because, yeah. I mean, I, you could, I, I could see how a guitar player could come here, go to Lower Broadway, watch some of those guys just play incredibly crazy stuff, you know? Or listening to records or whatever, just be scared off, like, eh, I don't know if I want to deal with that. You know, um, but I, I don't think it's about competing necessarily. I think it's about being creative. You know, if you're if you really enjoy making records and um, you enjoy playing music, like there's, I think that you should give it a shot. If you feel that you should, you know, if you feel like you need to, like I did. You know, I felt like man, if I'm if I'm in my forties and I didn't try, I'm always it's always going to be in the back of my mind. You know. So, um, yeah, Mike, Mike Brett telling me there's, there's always room, you know, if, if you can make the room for yourself. I thought that was really helpful. And what advice would you give, you know, to others, you know, from your experience in the studio so far? Uh, like advice for, for doing sessions yeah. in particular? Yeah, and to young guys that are wanting to do that. Um, be patient. Because it's, it, I, I think it's a really, really slow process. You know, there are so many great guitar players playing on records right now. I mean, it's very, I, I think it's pretty saturated, honestly. You know, there, there's guys who have been doing it for decades who are still, still playing and they're fantastic. You know, mm-hmm. they're like these giants, you know, that I look up to in a way. And then there's sort of the, the younger class that's come in that I feel like I'm kind of right at the back of that, you know of the big 
uh, there's sort of a big changeover where yeah. where producers there's, and and writers were like, man, we, let's get let's get let's get a young guy on each session. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll get a young guitar player and a really established guitar player. So we have we have the stuff that we know is really great, like the guy whose credits are you know pages, and then we've got the new guy that. It's just going to do something exciting and fresh, you know. Well, that's right. that's the hope. Yeah. So, um, I would say uh, patience for sure. You know, Is it, I mean, it's it's a pretty slow process. Yeah. But the 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 slowness of it is is good. I think. Let's talk about some of the people you've played with. So, uh, what are some of the uh, of the sessions that you've done? What would be uh, some of your you know kind of personal highlights? Man. Um, I, I've had just the fortune to play with a lot of really fantastic artists, and to be you know to be out on the floor with some incredible players. I'm like, oh gosh, I can't believe him. I can't believe that guy has to listen to me play. You know, <laughs> he probably he probably has me turned down. <laughs> um, so there, there's a few uh, indie records that. I think came out really well, and I'm really, really happy about for um, for strictly musical reasons. And there's some, you know, some pretty big records that I've gotten to be a part of that are musically really, really cool. But also, like everybody knows their name. Like everybody knows Steven Tyler, right? Yeah. I got to play on his record. Yeah. Holy cow! Yeah. You know, that was. I, I mean, I was in seventh grade trying to figure out the intro to Dream On. As a kid, you know, and then there's my name on his record. So yeah. that's that's kind of surreal. That doesn't feel like reality to me, you know. Yeah. Um, probably one of the biggest records that I played on was was uh, Chris Jansen. I played on his single, the "Buy Me a Boat" track. Okay. And um, that song went platinum, <laughs> yeah. which is pretty rare these days, you know. It uh, is. And he's doing fantastic. He's so good. I mean, you got to hear him play harmonica. Just as an aside, when we're all done, yeah. go YouTube Chris Jansen harmonica. It'll, okay. blow, it'll blow your mind. work what are you the most proud of that you you know you would say you know listen to this track and this is kind of indicative of what you know what I do or what I'm proud of oh man off. um there was a record that I got to do a couple years ago last year maybe I think I think it was a year or two ago I'm not sure uh and basically they just let me play whatever I wanted there was zero direction given mm-hmm. like absolute trust you know they wanted me to contribute creatively like just do what you want you know and so I feel like that record uh, has a lot of sort of my heart and soul in it you know in my playing it's uh it's it's my friend Shannon Labrie okay I was ecstatic when I heard it it's like that came out Really yeah. great. It was so much fun. 
So, but so to contrast that, normally you know producers are going to give you a, a fair amount of input on on what you play. Yeah. Yeah. So how much are they are they going to hum lines? Or are they just going to give you general terms like, "Is I want something that's more." Uh, in this vein, you know, what what are some common uh, suggestions or directions that you're given by a producer? Well, you can you can experience the whole gamut of that in one song with one guy. You mm -hmm. know, like they they have a very specific idea for what they want you to play in the intro, but they want your uh, your take on what would be cool for the solo or for something different for the second verse. Yeah. Whenever you need to change gears, you know. Yeah. So I. I mean, I've had loads of producers and songwriters sing me the line that they want. Okay. Or sometimes it's in the work tape when you're listening down mm -hmm. or the, the rough demo and, you know, they're, they're like, hey, let's, let's learn that. We want to stick to that. Or yeah. they'll say, eh, is that cool? <laughs> I'm like, of course it's cool. You wrote it. Uh -huh. I think I'm, it's melodically, it's stuck in my head. Let's, let's go with what you got, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, the biggest thing is just the trust. You know, they, they, they trust that you're going to, that, that's the amazing thing to me. Like, I feel like, I feel like these producers and songwriters are handing me their baby, right? Their song. This is, it's like their child, right? Mm -hmm. And they're trusting me to dress that child up in a way that's going to, you know, dress him for success or something, you know, like he's, yeah. and this is where the analogy breaks down. It's like a baby walking into a job interview <laughs> <laughs> or something. I don't know. Yeah. But it, it's but the, but there is that trust there that that's that's created in in uh, in in them you know wanting you to you know help you know finish out you know, their art. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's uh, for lack of a better word, it's it's humbling that people would trust you with something that's so close to who they are, you know, in in their creative process and everything. So it's pretty cool. Justin, let's talk gear for a minute. Okay. So, uh, so tell me about this guitar that you have, this 335. Man, uh, I've always wanted a really good 335. Okay. And I've had a few. Uh, I think that they're more all over the map than any other model of guitar. From okay. specimen to specimen, they just sound so different. I found this on eBay. Um, it was for sale in Knoxville. And it had a dead neck pickup, and the wiring harness was almost completely shot. Uh, it's a 1982 Tim Shaw era. They went back to the the right neck shape, mm -hmm. dot neck, you know. Um, and I offered the guy, I sent the guy a message through eBay. I was like, look, I'll, I'll give you cash and come pick this up because I don't want to have it shipped, you know. And uh, I offered him 1800 bucks, which... With all the issues, I thought that was really fair. He declined. He's like, I think I'm going to let the auction run its course, you know. Well, I want it for less than 1800 bucks. Then I said, well, I still want to come pick it up. So I went and got it from him in Knoxville. And I put a new wiring harness in it, which I never want to do again. That's a really complicated it's, process. It's very, very difficult. Well, it's, you just have to have a lot of strings yes. running through all the holes so you can pull everything into place at once. It yes. has to all happen at once. Yes, I've, um, I've done it multiple times. I don't want to so do sorry. it again. I'm yeah. so sorry. Yeah. Uh, and I put the Bigsby on it, and it had a Nashville bridge, which yes. was not in great shape. So I put an ABR on it. I actually had to get um, a tap, like an 8-millimeter tap, to drill the this or to create threads for the studs for this bridge. And then the Grovers that they came with, they were in terrible shape. And I was so in love with like old 335s. I'm like, I'm gonna yeah. put some old Clusons yeah. on it, you know? And man, it's just, I, I've never actually seen one this ambered before. It's 
very dark. This is an, yeah. originally a blonde finished guitar, yeah. you know, and I don't know if it sat in a shop window for years. It, it seems like it's really been played. And I wonder if it was just played outside a lot. You yeah. know, if you take the pit guard off, it's pretty blonde. Wow. But everywhere else, it's it's this sort of honeyed amber. Yeah, that's a lot of UV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, are those the, the Shaw pickups or are those other pickups you've put no, in? No, uh, I have the Shaws. I had the neck pickup rewound by Lindy Fralin. And okay. they're great pickups, man. They, they really are. Uh, but I'm one of those people who can't leave anything alone. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are Tom Holmes. Uh, Very nice. Yeah, he makes them right here in Tennessee, up in yeah. Jolton. And yeah. he is so brilliant. Have you ever been out to his place? I've never been out to his place. I've talked to him on the phone. It's almost yeah. worth it to buy pickups just so you can pick them yeah. up in person and check out his shop. Yeah. It's unbelievable. He does all his own electroplating. He makes yeah. every part. Yes. Pretty much every part. He orders the bobbins. I mean, it, it, his process is is pretty remarkable. Yeah. And just a, a quick aside, Holmes you know, is a very revered you know pickup maker, and he helped Gibson design the 57 Classic. Yeah, and uh, then he he makes these pickups, and they're they're quite hard to come by. There there's a kind of a long waiting list. It's not as long as people think yeah. anymore, because he's got a guy in Japan making uh, making them that he I guess taught okay. how to do it. I, I don't I don't want to like say anything definitively because I'm not totally sure of how right. it worked. But they're yeah. instead of the H450 and H455, they're J450s, J455s. So. When I got my first set from him, he was just finishing an order of 10 or 15 sets for the Black Crows, and he had like 100 sets that were being shipped to Japan. That's why I think there's so many that are being made over there. Um, but he's, the second set I went to pick up, he had he had some for, uh, oh gosh, Billy Gibbons, some more, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, he's, he's a genius. Yeah. I, I just think they sound great. They do a lot of... A lot of great things, you yeah. know. Well, grab that strat real quick and let's. Uh, sure. Let's talk about that also. You wanna take this for a second? Okay. Sure. And I can put it on the stand. Yeah, this is. Uh, Tell us about your strat here. Well, um, I'm sure you know Jeff Sin yeah, here in he's, town. He's been a guest of the True Tone Lounge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I have two of his guitars. I have okay. a, uh, this is a Fullerton, his Strat style. Um, and I originally ordered this with a, a maple neck. <clears throat> I still have the neck. Okay. We talked about doing something else with it. I just haven't yeah. figured out what yet. Um, I, well, I wanted kind of a 57 style Strat. Well, then I ordered a, uh, a Pomona from him, his T style, uh, Tele style. And it's got one of the biggest maple necks. It's like almost no caster-ish, you mm -hmm. know. And they kind of sounded the same. They're both alder body maple necks. So I thought, well, maybe I'll see if Jeff would put a, a rosewood board on this guitar. And since it's a two-tone burst, which is like 50s, real early 60s thing, I opted to, to stay in that era, and I went with a slab, a rosewood yeah. slab board. So this is kind of a 59, yeah. 59 style. Strat. And uh, what kind of pickups are in it? Well, these are all uh, Lawler Specials. Um, the bridge and the middle uh, came with the guitar. His favorite setup at the time, it may have changed. He liked the black face and the neck for the real clear mm -hmm. bell sounds, and then real hot middle and bridge pickups, you know. Um, but I, I ended up completing the special set, put a, put a special in the neck as well. Yeah. And how is is it? Wire, uh, how are you? How do you have it wired up? As far as the uh, the you know, because a lot of people will wire the tone control to the bridge pickup, or you know, what yeah. have you done there? Yeah, yeah. So this is a uh, bridge tone, mm -hmm. and then this one. When I got the guitar, it was just the neck, and the middle was left wide open, mm -hmm. which is actually really cool. And I've gone back yeah. and forth a few times, but currently I have the middle pickup soldered to this as well. So this this is for bridge and or sorry, middle and neck. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. Well, tell us about your pedal board now. Who? Uh, oh gosh! Did, did you put this together, or did someone else put this together? Uh, for this you? is a, this is an XTS creation that I have since uh, ruined. Okay. <laughs> I've modified it, and um, it's not it's not how I got it from them. So okay. if it if it screws up, it's my fault. It's not their fault. Okay. But 
So, so take us from the from the cable in. It looks like you've got like some kind of like junction box or something. That yeah, you yeah. Into. I've got an interface under the rails uh, that that you know was was their thing. Um, does, that, does that have a buffer in it or? No, no? mine's just okay. mine's just open. Okay. Um, and so the way I have it wired now, and this is part of what I changed. I had a different chorus and tremolo pedal in this spot that were at the end of the chain. Mm -hmm. But the way that it's wired up now is that it goes straight from the junction box to the Mobius. Okay. And the Mobius has an internal loop. So you can, I mean, it does, it does so many things, like, like it'll do a univibe, right? A mm -hmm. univibe wants to be in front of your overdrive pedals, to me, to my ear. Mm -hmm. But a uh, tremolo wants to be behind, right? Well, if you put all of your drive and boost pedals inside the loop, you can set where, you can set the univibe to be pre-loop. Mm -hmm. So it's in front of your overdrive. You can set the tremolo to be post, you know. Wow. So that's the way I have it. This entire strip is inside the loop of the Mobius. Okay. So with, the, with all the presets I have, I've got the univibe set to be before my overdrive and fuzzes, and I've got tremolo and pitch vibrato to be after, chorus is after, you know. Um, and then from there, it runs out to the, uh, the memory man. And this is kind of cool. The memory man has a loop as well, but it's a feedback loop. Okay. So you can put a pedal in its feedback loop and it'll only affect the repeats. Like okay. if you put a wah pedal in it, uh -huh. you have your dry sound, but you, you can, you know, open and close an envelope on the, on the repeats or whatever. And then that goes out to the flint, and the flint goes back to the out of the um, of the uh, the interface. So uh, we've let's uh, so we've got a couple other boxes here though. So we've got this uh, we've got this overdrive boost. Yes, and, and that's uh, I'm forgetting who, who who throwback throwback. Yes, who also yeah. makes pickups. So they, yeah, yeah. So you've got that, then you've got the uh, the box of rock, and then uh -huh. what's, what's above that? That's a fat fuzz factory. Okay. It's basically a fuzz factory with a three-way toggle that has yeah. a couple, I think it's just capacitors, I'm not sure, but it, yeah. you, in the position one, it's a standard fuzz factory. <clears throat> in position two, it's, it's a little fatter, a little darker. Mm -hmm. Position three, it's like really fat. So. And then the, uh, the pitch fork is uh, kind of a cocked wah kind of thing, is it? That... No, it's, it's more of a, it's more of an octave pedal. Okay. It's. You can set it to any interval, okay. and you can set the switch to be momentary, so it just, if you don't have an expression pedal connected, you can set it to one octave up, and you hit it, and it's bring, you know, it just goes right up, back down when you let your foot off. I have it connected with an expression pedal, so I can control that. I almost never use that effect. I almost always use that as an octave down, or octave up, or both, because the switch, you can set it to up, dual, okay. or down. And what would you use that for? Well, just an octave effect, like uh, like a slide right. part, have a lower octave on it, or right. even both, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it it's, it sounds pretty good. It tracks pretty well. There's a tiny bit of a lag, but I don't really mind it. Oh. Um, now, tell us about this, uh, you know, this black box that says Boost on it. Yeah, so uh, XTS made that, and it's, it's literally just a completely transparent Boost okay. that you can operate with an expression pedal. Okay. So um, with it, I have it, the way I have it set right now, it's all the way down, that's unity gain. It's basically mm -hmm. doing nothing, but then I can use the expression pedal as a volume pedal. Okay. Without so, having a volume pedal pot loading my sound. So you're, so you're using that Dunlop volume pedal only as an expression pedal? Yes, yeah, it's not, it's only, it's, it has one cable going to the expressionator, <laughs> which mm -hmm. this is kind of a complicated board for being so small. Um, and then the other cable goes to the, uh, the boost. Okay. So, you, so your guitar is not going through the pot of a, of a volume pedal. It's going through this boost, and you have an expression out, and that's being controlled by the, the Dunlop. Yeah. And it basically goes from yeah. off to yeah. wherever you have the boost set. Right. So. Wow. That way you're able to get kind of a volume pedal without the, the loading of the signal. Absolutely, the passive, yeah. And then I the also passive. have a boost if I want to step on it for a solo or, or whatever. Yeah. And then tell us about this expressionator. Uh, that thing's ridiculous. That can take uh, one expression pedal and send it to 
up to three different pedals. Okay. So it's something I use rarely, you know, but uh, basically it's got banks A, B, and C. And right now, this is the way the unit boots up. They're all three on. Mm -hmm. But if you start to cycle through with the switch, it, it'll, it'll switch through all of them. If you want one to stay on, like right now, they're literally, I, like if I, if I rock the pedal, it's, it's controlling all three of them, which okay. can get to be ridiculous. Yeah. So what, what is it so, attached to? So bank A is the memory man. Okay which uh, has all these different expression. I have it turned off right now at the memory man, so. But I can set the blend of the delay, the rate and depth of the modulation, the feedback of the delay, or the delay time itself with, with just the pedal. Wow. And then B goes to the Mobius, and that, you know, you can cr control tremolo speeds, depth. Mm -hmm. uh, anything you can change can or be. Or create a wah effect. Yeah, 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 there's a, it's got a really, funky sounding wah that I actually really like. It yeah. doesn't sound, I mean, I've got a bunch of wah pedals that are legit, you know, mm -hmm. sound like old school. Like one that sounds like, you know, Hendrix, Band of Gypsies era or whatever. Uh, I've got a full tone wah that's really great. So then the... Uh, and then C goes to the pitchfork. Okay. Because it, in addition to being like kind of an octave pedal, like I use it 99% of the time, it it's, can be used as a whammy effect as well. Which I almost never, ever use. Yeah. Uh, it, somebody's got to ask me for it. Yeah. <laughs> There's not many times you're going to get asked on a national well, session. To... Sometimes, man. Lately, lately, people want want quirky, weird, you know, like do something I've never heard before. Okay. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to play something like... Yeah, as opposed to where's your telly, you yeah. know, and your twin, or yeah. where's your Les Paul and your Marshall, and just yeah. lay down the tone, you know. Yeah. So... I guess the uh, the final piece is the uh, the amp. So you've got a Tweed Deluxe. What year is this? Uh, I think it's a '58. Okay. Pretty sure. Yeah. Looks, um, looks in good condition. What kind of speaker do you have in it? It's the Jensen, yeah, the old the Jensen. Original. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Yeah. And is this one of your uh, you know most used you know session amps, or what? Are, what are some other amps that you would it, use it, on a session? Oh man, yeah. This is normally in my cartridge rig, but I okay. brought it home because. Uh, I want to try an El Nico Blue in it. Okay. Do the Daniel Lanois thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm a huge fan. Um, that that normally stays in my cartridge rig. The other amps in my cartridge rig are a uh, a '64 Baseman, which is the blonde circuit. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a black face right. amp, it was a transitional. Call, call them the tuxedo amps because they have the white knobs. And, Absolutely. Yeah. You know this stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's probably the amp that I use 80% of the time. Yeah. And I have a fantastic 69 Marshall 50 watt that uh, is a metal face, but it's plexi guts. Right. That is an amazing amp. The clean tone on that amp is, I'm, I'm actually plugging into that first a lot more lately. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you turn it up and it's like, this is the tone, you mm -hmm. know, old rock and roll. But turned down, it's really cool. And then uh, I have... A, um, a Tyler amp. Are you familiar with, with yes. Tyler? Uh, I met, <clears throat> met them uh, a few years ago and, and got a, uh, they call it the JT46. It's kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like a JTM45. Uh, I think that's the, the circuit that it's based off of. Mm -hmm. Mine's got KT66s and it's got this cool um, chime to it that's different. I, I tend to think of it as a cleaner Marshall with a matchless top end. Yeah. That's how I describe it to people. That's what I, those are the sounds I get out of it. Yeah. And in addition to those, uh, I have a full tone tape echo that I use all the time. And a, uh, I've got a spring reverb unit as well. I try to keep real tape echo and real reverb yeah. in my cartridge room. So yeah, the, but the non so this would be kind of your non cartridge pedal yes. board. Yes. No, my cartridge yes. board is, is is bigger than that. Uh, and it's and then you know you, so for a non cartridge you know session, you would have this board, and you'd have the Tweed Deluxe and maybe another amp. Or you know. well, usually um, I take one amp okay. to non cartridge sessions. And yeah. like I said, this is normally in my cartridge rig. Okay. Now so, that I'm trying yeah. speakers on it, I'm carrying it around to use kind of. Yeah. So out. what is your, your non-cartridge amp that you would use most of the time? Uh, I have 
a really great old deluxe reverb. Mm -hmm. And if I had to use one amp the rest of my life, it'd probably be that. You can yeah. do anything with a deluxe. Yeah. I feel like a deluxe just sounds like electric guitar. That's, yeah. that's what it's supposed to sound like. Yeah. It's got excellent reverb, a great tremolo circuit. You can crank it, like 10, roll the bass off, crank the treble, and it's like one of the meanest guitar solo tones ever. Or you can turn it way down and it's, you know, it's that fat Fender, yeah. scooped Fender black, black yeah. face cleans. Now, everybody, everybody takes the, the speaker out of the, you know, the original speaker out, because most of the time they're yeah. blown. So yeah. what speaker do you put in yours? Uh, mine currently has the uh, WGS ET65. And um, I've got that speaker in a lot of things. I think a lot of people are using that speaker yeah. in town. It's just, it kind of sounds like a greenback, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, you're safe to not blow it because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a 65 watt speaker. And it's just got this really cool, kind of funky thing to it that I think sounds really good. You know, it holds together well, but, but it's got a it's, a, it's just a really interesting take on the greenback sound. Yeah. And it's cheap. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Which is always nice. It's, yeah, they make them, you know. An hour away, two hours away from mm -hmm. Nashville. Not from here, but um, that's the one I have in my deluxe. And I, I sometimes I'll take a, uh, I've got a 66 Princeton Reverb that I paid a grand for. <laughs> Very nice. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. I, it was a long time ago. When yeah. I was on the road, uh, I would check Craigslist of the city I was going to, mm -hmm. find some deals. I found that in Lowell, Massachusetts. And uh, that doesn't have the original speaker in it either. It's a, uh, I've got an old 90s Mojo Tone mm -hmm. ceramic. Yeah. You remember they had the like the pink and blue yeah. logo? Yeah. <clears throat> the bubble font. It took me forever to find a second one of those, but I have another one in a box. I, I got them for like 30 bucks each. You just never find them. You know, they're, they're made by Eminence uh, for Mojo Tone and they just sound different than all the other ceramic tins. I've, I've been, in the Princeton, I've probably been through 20 speakers. Yeah. So you've stuck with the tin on that? You haven't tried to go with the, with no, the 12? No, I've had several 12s in it. Yeah. yeah. Didn't like them? Well, I do, but I think that cab is supposed to have a 10 in it. Yeah. It gets to where it's too much speaker for the cabs yeah. many times. I'm just getting to the point where I question Leo Fender less and less. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he knew what he was doing. Yeah, I think so, you know? Or he yeah. was really lucky. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. Well, Justin, thank you so much for coming out. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, thanks for having me.